Good morning, family. This is Brother Vimeo Diaz. How y'all doing? This is Team Marathi. Everybody, Team Marathi. Soul Lightning. Peace to you. Peace to your home. Peace to your family. Peace to your community. Peace to your ancestry. Peace to my community. Peace to my ancestry. And peace to the nation that you, I, and they are creating. Peace also to the God of Forces, the Great Spirit above, Mother below. How y'all doing? I have been going through a lot of my old videos, a lot of which I have never, ever posted. Um, that may be happening sometime over the next year. Um, you know, I don't talk a lot about politics, but I want to talk some politics because um, we as black folks, we are kind of encouraged politically to be disengaged at every level. And um, this is usually because the people who we are listening to locally are themselves taught how to be disengaged at every level. We are taught that there are only specific small cues that we need to be paying attention to and small cues that we need to be sending to politicians. Um, for an example of this, we are taught that um, voting rights is something that we need to be spending an exorbitant amount of time on. Voting rights is massively important. It is important. But my research with Dr. King um, has uncovered a speech from 1964, which uh, he says in that speech, and it's it's one that is actually posted on, on my page. Um, it's... Um, uh, the Negro Revolution, why 1963, if I'm not mistaken, that is the title of it. And he says in that speech, he says, look, we are not just trying to have one right while we excuse the rest of them. And that right that he was talking about was voting rights. It seems that that was not heated from that point on. This was done in 1964 again, and it seems that it wasn't heated from that point onward that black people, we were only supposed to be attentive to one, maybe sometimes even two points of concern. Voting rights, you know, getting every getting every black person to vote, which, you know, um, we have really good turnout where we're not being suppressed and, and oppression and suppression is happening right now. Um, our right to vote has always been up in the air over the last 10 years, it has been, well, over the last 20 years, let me be very frank about this because this goes all the way back to the 2000 presidential election, it has been under severe attack. And because it has been under severe attack and nobody, the Democrats included, have done very little to stop this, um, we are now back, in many instances, we are, in, we are being placed into a position where um, we are no, we are, our voting ability, um, has degraded down to like the 1970s, 1960s again, and it's probably going to get worse. Um, that said, we are still, we are encouraged to worry about a couple of things. And trust me when I tell you, this is not by accident. This is by design. So voting rights is the first one. And then the second one that we're supposed to really care about is violence in our community, which the reason why I want to harp on that one is because it is my belief. I was a friend of mine uh, sent me an article. It wasn't a very good article, so I'm not going to cite it verbatim, but it did point out something. Um, and it was very brief, but it did point out something that many black people, I think, assume is correct but don't often say it. That a lot of the violence that occurs in the black community during these summer months, when you know suddenly black people are being killed and the police officers, uh, the police units, don't seem to have any clue on who's doing it, may in fact be, and again, this is something that I think most of us assume as, as true, may in fact be police officers or gangs that are associated with various in, uh, interests in the community which are doing these things, which are 
killing people in order to keep this myth perpetuated. Now, I'm not saying this is true. I am not saying this is true. But what I am saying is there is there is a thought pattern which does wonder if that could be what's going on. Because look, this isn't this is not unusual. Some of the people who are killed, we hear it consistently and constantly. These people were good people. They were not your drug runners. They were not people who were in the streets doing diabolical things. These were good people. And yet, boom, they're dead. Or this person or that person um, was doing things to help the community. They were a pillar in the community. Boom, they're dead. Now, to me, that seems to be, that's evil intention. That's evil intention. Now, either we're talking about something possessive that is jumping and doing these things where it's literally going after people from a spiritual level, or you're talking about something on a physical level, which is deliberately going after these people in order to scare other black people and to keep the community on edge. Now, this program... Because again, you know, one of the things that I look at, you know, is patterns. This program could have easily been implemented since the 1970s. Why? Because in the 1960s, the FBI straight up said, we need to watch out for the rise of a, of a black messiah. Well, how do you, well, excuse me, I, the, the, the FBI said they need to stop the rise of a black messiah. How do you stop the rise of a black messiah? We have been under, as black folks, we need to now understand this. We have been under a, a decree, just like in the Bible, where in the Bible, Pharaoh says, what? What? Kill all the firstborns. We have been under a decree just like that. Kill all the firstborns. And, excuse me, guys, I'm sorry. It is likely that what we are witnessing, if in fact it's true, what we are witnessing is the execution of that decree. Now, again, like I said, this could be a physical manifest, this could be um, a physical um, uh, program, or this could be a spiritual program, but it is clear that there's some sort of a program going on here. And we, as black folks, I think we assume this. Um, there was a, a brother that I was listening to years ago, and he was talking about how in his community, he was talking to a um, former gang member who, I think this was in Chicago. I know it was in a Midwest city. It was a decent sized Midwest city. Uh, this, this gang member would tell him, you know, that a couple decades ago, they would, black folks now, they would find guns, boxes and boxes of really nice guns just out on the street. Like they would go into they would go into an alleyway and they would find all of these guns. Now where did these guns come from? Now where did these guns come from? You know where they came from. Now if we were under such a decree as the Pharaoh saying, look, let's kill, each, kill, kill the firstborn of every black uh, family, you would expect something like this. Cocaine, crack, well, not cocaine so much, heroin in the, in the 70s, um, crack, cocaine in the 80s and 90s. I mean, th it's, it's a process. It's a process. And if you look at our, supposedly, our population rates in this country, our population, um, the percentage of the population which black people comprise ha is static, is static. And that's massively important. You must understand that. So we are taught to care only about a couple of things. And uh, uh, education is usually number three. Education is usually number three. It's sometimes, you know, drugs are number three. Um, they would, you know, group the family in there with that one. Um, and then education, uh, which, you know, our schools have traditionally been kept bad. This is something also that Dr. King talked about in 1966. The reason why I harp on Dr. King, ladies and gentlemen, is because Dr. King, who is upheld by everybody, 
who pick and choose, choose what they want to say about the man. They pick and choose what they want to say about the man. The reality is he talked so much about the things that are afflicting us today and his his legacy is being constricted. It is being really truthfully, if I could be honest with you, it's in many ways being held hostage because if people understood what the man really stood for, it would, especially for black people, because we have a very degraded view of who Dr. King is, and that is done deliberately. It's just like Malcolm X. Most people don't understand the power of Malcolm X, man. I got a book on his speeches um, from the last, I think it was year of his life. Malcolm X was a powerful man. Way powerful. I don't study him like I studied King, because King was on another level for me. But even Malcolm was powerful, and they they really do a, a, a lot. Him and um, uh, Marcus Garvey, they really do a lot to constrict these individuals. So um, we are, and trust me, family, you need to be studying these guys, because despite what they're talking about with this whole nonsense, uh, and it is nonsense, where they're like, oh, well, you know, um, uh, uh, the toxic masculinity and, you know, uh, Dr. King and, you know, all these guys who are in the civil rights movement, they didn't want to really, you know, let women in. And there's a reason for that because they were getting their heads busted open. You don't send women in to do that. I mean, let's, let's be fair about this. You don't send women in when you know that these devils are trying to kill you. And I mean that you have, I'm not being nice about these guys. I'm not. Oh, well, you just called them devils. Yes, I did call them devils because they acted like devils. When they're trying to kill grown men and children, young men who are 15 and 16 years old, and they're trying to kill them, you're going to send women into that? Come on. Let's be real about this. But we, we are encouraged to really care about one or two things at a time. Presently, it's criminal justice reform. Presently, it's criminal justice reform. Family, this is one of the reasons why. And by the way, I want to—I got to bring this up. This is one of the reasons why we need to—we need to up our political game. We need to get smarter politically. We need to get massively smarter politically. Um, we are often told that Martin Luther King didn't have an international sense about him. And this is just fundamentally untrue. Uh, Martin Luther King actually did do a little bit of traveling to Africa. And in 1961, I want to say, he actually talked, he, he, he delivered um, a very short speech on South Africa. And in many of his early speeches, you can see him making reference to Africa and the importance of Africa to black people and the rising spirit of pride in black Americans when they looked at Africa. Martin Luther King, with Malcolm, it was more precise. Malcolm talked consistently and constantly about Africa. Now, this is important because when was the last time you thought about Africa and what was happening in Africa. When was the last time you thought about Africa and what was happening in Africa? The whole world, and I mean this, the whole world is concentrated on Africa because Africa is where most of, and it's kind of funny, it's Africa and South America are where most of your really, um, really good sources are. I hate using the word resources. Sources are natural sources that you can then utilize um, to build your civilization. It's Africa and South America. There's also a lot of stuff in the, Pacific, in the Pacific Ocean too, but most of it's way too deep to get to. That is why the world is concentrated on it. You as a black person, you're not. You aren't. They got you making arguments about American descendants of slavery needing to be separated from Afrocentrism and Pan-Africanism, when in fact, that's not the argument. And I've stated that before. The argument is, what is going to happen to ADOS if it's if it is um if it's successful here? What do you think that's going to do to the rest of the world? Because trust me when I tell you, yes, many of the Caribbeans who come here 
are from the conservative faction. That's why they're allowed to come into the country. And then they are scared off by the government to keep them from partnering with black people in the United States. What the hell do you think is going to happen when ADOS is successful here? Suddenly, you're going to see Jamaican descendants of slavery. You're going to see Cuban, well, not necessarily Cuban descendants of slavery, different thing. Um, Bermudan uh, descendants of slavery. You're going to see Mexican descendants of slavery. You're going to see all of this. In black folks, we are not going to be prepared. We need to raise our political game in the next 10 years because the world is actually literally counting on it. The world is literally counting on it. We need to raise our political game. We need to become more engaged in domestic issues. We have to develop a political vision for our society. <laughs> Hear what I just said. We need to develop a political vision for our society for our society. That's one thing that we have never been told to do. Dr. King had a vision. We are told he had a dream. Dr. King didn't have it. He, that, that was a speech. That was a speech. Dr. King actually did have a vision. It was called the beloved community. It wasn't necessarily um, achievable at the time, but he still had a vision. Malcolm X had less of a vision, but he had a vague vision. He was more about his rhetoric than he was the vision. Um, Marcus Garvey had a vision. Now, he had a vision. And Medgar Evers, who was a Garveyite, one of the reasons why I believe he was killed. He was a Garveyite. He had a vision. And his was less compromising than um, Malcolm's. His was far less compromising than Malcolm's. Uh, Garvey was a nationalist. And he was unapologetic for it. Now, we need to develop this wonderful, wonderful vision. Because many of your middle class black people, they ain't developing it. None of your upper class black people are developing it. Well, maybe not none of them. There might be a couple of them. But we need to develop this vision. If we fail to develop this vision, family, it, it's the, the, the times that we're coming into, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be bad. We're not going to be able to survive, possibly. We need to start developing that vision. Now, to be fair, there are many people who have portions of this vision. And so it's not about one or two or three or four people. It's really about getting together a group. Now, I like Boyce Watkins. I think Boyce Watkins is doing amazing work. I've said that before. But one of the problems that I have with Boyce Watkins is Boyce Watkins is a capitalist. And I know he he says, oh, well, you know, the capitalist is what this is. And that, uh, you might want to take the temperature of this country again, because this country is is about to explode one of two ways. It's about to go extraordinarily fascist or it's going to go socialist. Why? Because capitalism has not served the people. Now, there's a book called um, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And there's another one that I cannot remember, but it's by uh, Manny Marables, I think is his name. I think is his name. And that one has more to do with um, black, I think it's literally called black capitalism. And it's from the 60s and 70s. I'm family, it, if you really want to do some massive amount of research on black people and get the real scoop on where we where we were at and why we ain't there, why we aren't where we should be at, should I say, where we were at and why we aren't where we should be, forget about it. Today, I, I hate to tell you, but the old homage that... um. You know, the old folks, two, three generations used to say about becoming too smart for your own good. I hate to say it, but on many occasions, it's the truth. Many of the books written today ain't good. They aren't telling, they're not telling the story that needs to be told about um, the problems <clears throat> that have kept us um, ground under. And so a lot of the books that I'm reading 
come from the seven come from the seventies, the sixties, the eighties, the fifties. Because that's where the best research was done. Today, without the foundation of those older books, you won't understand what you're reading, or you won't be able to um get the full depth of it. Because they leave out that earlier information, which is massively important. Trust me when I tell you it's massively important. So, you know, look back then for help, you know, help in uh, in understanding our present situ uh, situation. Uh, we need to have we need to have a vision. Now, um, Neely Fuller Jr., because I don't talk about him a lot, and I know there's a, there's a person who listens and is just like in love with Neely Fuller Jr. Um, Neely Fuller Jr. adds some adds an incredible uh, uh, gift to all of this information, um, and an incredible insight to all of this information. Looking at his definition of racism is helpful, but Neely Fuller Jr. offers nine areas of people activity. Uh, there's one more that was added by um, uh, uh, Professor Hiawatha, uh, Hiawatha Kia, uh, uh, Kaba, Kaba, uh, Professor Kaba. So it was uh, added by him, and he adds nutrition. So there's 10 of them in all. Well, what these all represent, and I've said this before, is they represent disciplines. Now, there's going to be other disciplines. But these represent disciplines. And in order to have a functioning society, you need these disciplines um, developed and integrated into a vision. Now, uh, Claude Anderson kind of says the same thing. So his power, uh, his poweronomics is a part of that. So, you know, uh, utilize what Neely Fuller says. Look at those 10 individual uh, areas of people activity as disciplines. Combine those disciplines with paranomics and then also get, and I mean, it's not, it's a good book, but it's, there's, there's some, you could definitely tell it's not where it should have been. It wasn't polished. Um, but the blueprint to black power, which is also very, very good by Amos Wilson. Be ready for that. Uh, give me one second. All right, so following the ancestors, because the ancestors are really speaking through me and to me right now, um, they wanted me to show you this, so I'm going to show it to you. I'm talking about Amos Wilson's uh, book, Blueprint to Black Power. The reason why I say be ready for it is because I got it. This is the Blueprint to Black Power, okay? The reason why I say be ready for it, look at that, okay? So be ready for that. This, this is family, you know, it's maturity time. It is maturity time. And we have to be ready to mature. This, this type of book, and I'm going to be honest with you, man, I ain't studied this like I needed to. I haven't. Um, I've had it for a few years. I have looked through it. I have read sections in it. Um, it is, it is deep. It is deep. Um, there's areas where you could definitely tell it needed some polishing. But it is still a massively powerful and good book. The only reason why it is not more well known is because he died like right after, either right before or right after it was published. And so this, th this should be required reading for all black people. And I'm saying, you know, um, uh, one of the things that I agree with with Boyce Watkins is uh, you need to be financially literate, you know, basically from the time that you're a toddler and he's right by the time children are eight years old they should know this book i'm not lying they should know this book now there's another book that i was looking for and i couldn't find it um is um and the reason why i really couldn't find it uh is because <laughs> as you can tell i'm in a new place uh and, and some of my books still aren't up so but the book is, and I've mentioned it before, the uh, cultural identity of black children, which is not the title of the book. Anyway, uh, it's an, it's another book which let me see if I can find this quickly. 
this is one that all parents need to have. Um, I won't say that all black children need to know this, but it would probably do them good. This is a very easy read. Um, and it is one. I like this book because it helps make real, it helps, um, uh, make sense of the actions that you do unconsciously. <clears throat> when I first read through this, I said to myself, man, if I had that book when I was 10, 13, it would have helped me so much because I saw myself in that. So th this is stuff to help you get politically mature family. And I'm not, I'm not trying to act like, um, you know, this is all you have to read or, you know, these books are better than other books. These are just books that I know. So I'm going to keep going because um, the ancestors, again, they're talking to me and they're telling me, you know, show them, man, let them, let them see these things so they can, so they can go out and they can buy them because um, these things are massively important. Now, this is something, um, and I grabbed the second volume, not the first one, but this is something that every black person by the time they are the age of 20, should should have read. This is the quintessential study of the black issue in America. Now, this is, I think this was done in the 1950s, I want to say. It still is relevant. It's a two-volume book. You're going to spend about $40 to $50 on it. Um, but it is well worth it. It is well worth it. This was done by a... I think he was Swedish. Might have been German. But anyway, a European sociologist and a group of sociologists who went into the South. I wish they had done more extensive research in the North. But went into the South to study the, quote, Negro problem. And basically what they discovered was it wasn't a Negro problem. It was a white problem. But but if that was all this book was, I would tell you not even to worry about it. Again, this is volume two. There's another volume to this. There's volume one. So it's a very thick book. And what it does is it fundamentally breaks down black people. It fundamentally breaks down um, our interaction with, with American culture. And um, I'm sorry, but I'm making sure that I keep my eye on the clock. Um, and it fundamentally details what we have become because of this culture. Again, um, just to help you out with this, I hope you can see that. Okay. An American Dilemma is the title of this book. Get this book. This is something, again, by the age of 20, everybody should know. Another one everybody should be reading children should be reading this, is The Miseducation of the Negro. The Miseducation of the Negro. I didn't pull it down, but um, that's one that every black family should have in its home, as well as um, uh, The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. Um, I would also say Getting the Black Bourgeoisie is also um, a good investment. Uh, that one's still actually put away, so I can't really get that one. Um, another one that I kind of found by accident. This one isn't necessarily as um, potent as the other ones, but I think it is. Um, it's very powerful nonetheless, and I, I was just flipping through it and realized I have a book by one of these guys, a couple of books by Charles V. Hamilton. Um he is, uh, I, I didn't realize that he was a radical back in the day, but he obviously was. Anyway, so this is the book, okay? This book, Black Politics, The Inevitability of Conflict. It is by, and you'll find this a lot, man. There's a lot of books that are, that, and I don't mean this to be derogatory or anything, but it seems to have there. I seem to find a lot of books from this time period with Jewish authors. 
Edward S. Greenberg is the important name. That's the first one on the on the cover. So Black Politics, The Inevitability of Conflict, Edward S. Greenberg. Um, that's another one. Another really good one to have in your home, <clears throat> and really anything by this guy. He's 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 amazing. He's an amazing author and um wrote a lot about black people. Um, in order to help us. Uh, this one is called Harvesting New Generations. Harvesting New Generations. And it is by <clears throat> um, Yusemi Eugene Perkins. Yusemi Eugene Perkins. Um, this is really good. Uh, I have a few books by him. And this book in particular really just tackles um, uh, some of the issues with raising black children and then some of the things that we need to be looking at in order to do it correctly. Uh, particularly, the back of the book, chapter 15, he has something called the Afrocentric Socialization Paradigm, which is, check it out. Check it out. So that's another book. Um, <clears throat> for you Christians, for you Christians, I discovered this one, and um, this is something, uh, the, I actually have two books by him. This is something that I think would help a lot of you Christians figure out where you need to take Jesus the Christ. Um, and I'm not talking about in a negative way either. Uh, this book is called uh, Black Christian Nationalism. It's not the type of nationalism that you think. This is actually a very powerful book. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I haven't really delved into this in about four years now. Um, <clears throat> a lot of sermons. A lot of sermons. He wrote another book called uh, The Black Messiah, which also should be gotten. The Black Messiah. And his name is Albert B. Cleage? Albert B. C. L. E. A. G. E. Jr. C. L. E. A. G.E. Jr. So the Black Messiah, um, but also Black Christian Nationalism. These are two, they're older books. They're from the 70s, but they're really good. They're amazing, amazing and powerful books. Um, and for those, the, um, the Black Christian Church is under severe strain right now because it is, young people don't want anything to do with it. And the reason why young people don't want anything to do with it is because it's not feeding their soul. I've been talking to, uh, all right, I got to get ready to get out of here. I've been talking to a couple of people who are involved in the church and I have told them, if you're not feeding them, um, ancestral stuff, forget it. You're not going to win them over. Um, the next book is Marcus Garvey, um, and the vision of Africa. Uh, this one is very cool because it is by John Hendrick Clark, or should I say, it is edited, and um, uh, there is commentary provided by John Hendrick Clark. This one, I believe, is from the 70s. I'm not sure. But again, Marcus Garvey and the Vision of Africa, edited, uh, and with commentary from John Hendrick Clark. This is a good book. This is another good book. I like this book. Um, and then, finally, from one of our great elders... Um, it doesn't really get a lot of the mainstream press that he should. Uh, and by mainstream, I'm not talking about white mainstream. I'm talking about our mainstream. Um, Wade Nobles. Saku. This is a good one, too. Um, very, very informative. Um, so this one, this one is really going to, um, this is going to get into your mind. So check that out. Check that out. Seeking the Saku. Okay. So um, it's time to raise us politically. It's time to get our minds correct. And um, I'm sorry, but I got to get going, guys. I hope this helps. Peace.